Start in verse three this morning. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Still after Easter, right? For 40 days, Jesus had been speaking to specifically his disciples about the kingdom. Like last, some last training sessions for church planning and mission operating and all those things. And you'd think after that long, they would have gotten this by now. But somehow they're still having trouble understanding how the kingdom operates. And to me, if, if the disciples struggled when they had Jesus physically, like, visible to them, saw the, all these signs and, and wonders, if they struggled, how much more are we going to struggle? How much more help do we need? I don't know about you. I, I need a lot of help. Amen. I need help. Constant reminders. And that's what the body is for. That's why we have, that's why we gather weekly, hopefully more than, more than one day a week, to teach and, and, and fellowship and preach the word and study the Bible. It, it's vital to our spiritual growth. Weeks fly by, and we haven't changed much, much humanity. We, we've been distracted since the beginning, since the fall. It was a distraction. Weeks fly by, and we forget what our purpose is somehow. We get busy, right? The church was established by Christ for a missional purpose. It's an individual, but it's missional. But the warning to not forsake gathering together, obviously not for you this morning, but often that warning that, yeah, we have it in Hebrews, but... The heart of it is everywhere in the Bible. To don't stop gathering together because you're going to get distracted and you're going to get busy and you have to work and things happen. But it's taken lightly today. And the, the words of Jesus, thankfully, they still correct our misinterpretations and our focus and our miscommunication, as Kevin was talking about. So here Jesus is speaking, we had the last call, the last follow me, but now this is really his last words before the ascension. And sandwiched between where he wants them focused, which is the, the power of the Holy Spirit, is the evidence of their misguided interpretation. And the evidence is in their question. Jesus said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Their response, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And sounds, it echoes the same question that the Pharisees asked in Luke 17, 20. Being asked by the Pharisees, 
when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Jesus consistently redirected questions. And that's because the questions that we ask reveal our hearts. The questions that we ask reveal our hearts. Often when when people ask me questions for clarity, I'll say, well, what do you mean by that? (laughs) That's, That's a good question to follow up a question to. Like, what exactly are you saying? Because you need context to find out why someone is asking a question or what they actually mean. Because usually, we're asking a question with another motive behind it. Now today, we can't talk to the disciples, but you know what's cool? We have context, because we have the Bible. And by looking at the context of where this question comes from, we can find out the disciples' hearts, and then the application is how we apply it to our life. Jewish disciples looking through a Jewish lens. So we'll start with that context. Where are they? They're in Jerusalem. This is the capital of their faith. Now, we kind of understand that if if we're all non-Jewish. But for them, it's it's like the center of the universe. It's not just like, oh, the capital is Washington, D.C. or whatever. It's not, it's not like that, or the capital of Des Moines, you know, that golden, cool building. No, to them, it's the meeting place of heaven and earth. It's really important. And the whole universe in a Jewish mind revolves around this city. And what they were expecting through that lens is... When the kingdom comes, there's going to be a rule. There's going to be a domination. There is going to be literally a military campaign coming out of the temple because it had to be blessed by God. It would be a campaign that eradicated all the evil in the world and took over and ruled the world. And wiping out Romans and and Gentiles and things like that. This is what is in there. It's ingrained in there. So they're they're in Jerusalem. They're they're hearing about a spirit coming. Here here Jesus is in a risen body. Obviously he's special. This, This is serious. And we're about to, we're about to see it. We're about to see the kingdom. And that's where this question is coming from because they remember prophecy and they would have remembered Joel 2 28. Now, well, I'll just start in verse 28. It shall come to pass after I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And you usually stop there, especially, especially in our movement, right? We love these verses, sure. Nothing wrong with that. But then you heard it all. Verse 30 says, And I will show you wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. In the chapter number this morning. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel. 
because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people and have traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it. And for time's sake, I'm going to skip to verse 9. And you can read the whole thing later. Verse 9 says, Proclaim this among the nations, consecrate for war! Stir up the mighty men! Let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares with swords, and your crew go to the spears, let the weak say, I am a warrior. Hasten and come among the strong nations, gather yourselves, bring down your warriors, O Lord, let the nations stir themselves up, and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go and tread for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their evil is great. Different perspective, right? When you actually read more than the Holy Spirit part. And for the disciples, they're not thinking about the word of God. They're still thinking about a power from down here when Jesus wanted them to be focused on a power from on high. They wanted, as a nation, independence and peace. Now, they had independence, but they didn't want to be surrounded by enemies all the time. Kind of sounds like they said they're great. They want to be conquering. They also wanted, and we see the verses about the fortune, specifically for Judah and Jerusalem, they wanted wealth because wealth in the Jewish mind is always associated with favor. If you are poor, you are not favored by the Lord. That's like a curse. I think we do that too sometimes. I'm pretty sure Jesus discovered that in the gospel. Another thing they wanted was a a purified religious system. So, like a permanent cleansing of the temple. No more corruption, right? They wanted these priests to have sold out to the Roman Empire to be judged and taken care of. So this is what this is what their hope is in, sandwiched in between what Jesus wants them to focus on. Because at this time, they were looking for a literal Jewish kingdom to be restored. Kind of like when King David reigned. When King David reigned, he administered justice and equity to, to his people, and according to the books of uh, Samuel and Kings, he expanded his territory until his, Israel became, for the time, a dominant state. Powerful. Mighty king, first Chronicles 18, 14. So David reigned over all Israel, and he administered justice and equity to all his people. Lord, is this, is this going to happen now? I mean, can, we, can we have that again? That sounds like to me kind of like what we do in America. We long for such a time when such and such was present. Why a better military, security, economy? Because that's going to make everything okay, right? They also associate the spirit coming with wealth. So they were thinking, this would be like King Solomon. Because when King Solomon reigned, First Kings 10, 27, the king made silver as common as Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the uh, Shekelah. Wealth. Power, independence, freedom. They also desired that pure religious state. And that's where the false prophets would be taken care of. All those false religious, religious systems and the, the things that we don't like or aren't holy, we want those eradicated. And for that, they're thinking about the days of Elijah. The prophet. 
who did some crazy, amazing, scary stuff. But she was 1838, and the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and lifted up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord is God, the Lord is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let no, let no one of them escape them. They seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook. He shall not slaughter them there. So that they want, they're looking for this, this to happen. They wanted it then, they wanted it now, and they wanted to know when exactly it was time, obviously. They were obsessed with putting around the gates and the times and the hours. And the thing is, everything that they wanted, the disciples, was about to find out. Everything they desired was, was right there, because the king might have come. They were asking the wrong questions. They should have asked about the Holy Spirit and said. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we, we ask the wrong questions. Sometimes we ask the wrong questions. We want, we want peace. Yeah, we want freedom, absolutely. Security, wealth, nobody wants to live in a church service, but We want justice, righteousness, we crave it. Things to be made right. And we want to know when we're going to get it. And we do this nationally, and we also do it individually. If you think about it. Nationally, like I said, we do it every four years. We do it again this year. We're looking for protection and freedom from a political change. Or a political figure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's necessarily evil, but it depends on the level of that hope, right? We long for, in that, we long for financial security. For our families and children. And yeah, it's an issue. We long for righteousness and we long for the liars to be silenced, right? So we do this as a nation, a larger community. We do it in individual communities and then down to the personal level, we do this as individuals. We want freedom from our personal struggles. We want peace of mind. We want to stop feeling like we're surrounded by enemies. Anybody ever feel that way? Amen. <coughs> we long for a bigger paycheck or material wealth to define our favor with God also. Because somehow this has morphed that idea that Jesus preached against with the whole wealth uh, equating with favor. It has morphed into evangelical Christianity. Because the health and wealth gospel will associate your wealth with your favor from God or your level of faith. That's what has happened there. Not saying God can't bless you. Absolutely you can do things like that. But that blessing doesn't participate in the equation that results in how your favor. Your favor is coming from the blood of Jesus and everything that he's done. Amen. And it has nothing to do with your blood. We long to be approved. You see, if, if, if Israel took over and was that superpower, they were the ones who had the admiration and the approval of man and all that. Why would we do this in our own? own lives too. We want to be accepted, and we like to not be accepted or not feel valued. Like Israel, we want to be chosen, right? Highly blessed and highly favored. After all, that's all we're here, right? 
We also want to purify our churches of falsehoods and defeat our enemies. In our lives, the people who hurt us, we want to see that, Lord, when are you going to make this right? You know? When are you going to make this right? Lord, I, I can't wait anymore. Like justice. I think about, I, I think of my wife, and I be so careful, but, um, mm, tell me, Lord, okay? Uh, someone who had hurt her in her past, justice hasn't been served to that person who committed a crime that is worthy of probably more than life sentence. And that's about all I can say, because I'm on live stream. And I'm still, I trust God, but I'm still going to bring my family. When is that going to be made right? And things like that. We groan and ask, when is this going to end? Why? Nobody else. Why does somebody else have to be sick? Why does somebody else have to pass away? Why does somebody else have to struggle? Where's the relief? Why are our bodies getting old? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want this back pain thing. I had it the other day. No, please. It's my fault for not such. I know. I know. <laughs> but we want relief. It was never about 
one nation, one location. It was always about all the people. All of humanity, the entire world. All the people of God. And in Christ, that is beyond, that is beyond the Jerusalem that we make in our mind. That we are fighting for often, that we want to protect. All who call upon his name. The CNA video was just talking to you on that. And, and when you're in his name, when you make him yes, Lord and Savior, the freedom already begins. John 8, 36 says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. There, there's not like, it doesn't say only if you're from this place or if you have this or... No, he said you're free, free. That's it. You're free. The treasure. The treasures we want cannot be found in the tax break or our bank accounts or our salary. Matthew 6, 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And I say that in a day where AI can come and steal your money right now. There's your thieves, perhaps, I don't know. How about justice and righteousness? Well, it's not going to be accomplished by wiping out our enemies. Um, by bashing our worst leaders. <coughs> I'm glad you Christians didn't kill me when I was like driving around with nine sails blasting, saying blasphemies to God out my window on a strip in Florida. Because that's, that was me as an atheist. Glad nobody killed me then because I was one of those non you know, Christians. The reality is, as far as our enemies, the people that don't think like us, or the people that we, we get angry about, I, I, I don't know what else to say about that except this. Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus had been teaching all that because his kingdom had already gone. He wanted to focus on the mission to proclaim his message beyond one nation and race to all the world because everything that all the world can long for or ever want or try to be filled with in this life can only be found in the kingdom of God. And that's the message that all of humanity needs to hear. Matthew 6 and 3. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Well, how can we see what we can't see? I want to see it. I want to see it. I know, kids. I don't know. It's coming. Well, how can we see what we can't see? I can say that's all faith. It's called trusting in the authority and power of God, the one who you gave your life to. Trusting Him. And maybe the kingdom isn't fully seen yet because we still have lessons to learn as uh, modern day believers. We still have a mission to accomplish. When Jesus comes back and is seen by the whole world, when Jesus comes back, he will be seen by the whole world and by the it's too late. It's up. Time will be up. And time is what we have now. And it's ticking fast. Feels really fast. Maybe it's fast. I don't know. And our mission is to reach the, the world of Jesus Christ. So it is, it, let me say this. It is unloving. It is unloving for us as the church.
It is unloving for us as a church to be focused on our early faults and our rapture. It's unloving. Do you see how it's unloving? But Pastor, I want to be Jesus. I'm excited about it. Wait, have you seen the hurry and broken people all around you, even in this town? I can only have so much to share to see someone. What is happening? Yeah, there's all those people in this little small town. And in the place where we're probably our area we're from. I bet there's all this person everywhere right now. I'm not sure what they're doing. Or somebody addicted to meth. Every town, I'd say within a mile radius, there's somebody addicted to meth. There's somebody who's being abused. There's somebody who's about Jesus. It's all around us. For me to say, well, I can't wait until Jesus gets me out of here. Get me out of this place. To me, that's unloving. Because it's only about me. So maybe Jesus is delaying his return to give us time to wake up because the mission hasn't changed. It's still here. And that's because the kingdom is here. So are we going to ask him the right questions this morning? We have to stop asking, are you coming out to free us? Because in Christ you're already free. His kingdom and his reign has already been about and it's not going to stop. It's spreading. We just talked about this in parables. The mustard seed, shh, started small, goes all over the place. Leaven, the, the kingdom's like that. It's just going to keep going and going. It's not going to stop. You belong to a kingdom that is going to reign forever. You do not lose. We're more worried about the way off to them. We need to focus on the what. And that's like, what are we doing? What are we doing with our time? But, but, what about the way? I don't even know the way, right? We're teaching through Revelation, like five of us, but we know by now there's no timeline. I mean, the world ends in the book of Revelation like five times. We think we're going to find a timeline and you're wrong. And anybody teaching like that is wrong. There is no timeline. It's not like that. It's called recapitulation. You can look it up. It's just a revisiting of multiple uh, same events over and over again to bring home points. It's an apocalyptic literature. But we're still looking for a timeline. And ask yourself what's so about it. It's a service. Wait a minute, Pastor. What have you seen Israel and Palestine? We're at war right now. And I think the Armageddon armies are gathering. And we're the heifers, you know? We're, and the microchips, they're going to put in us. And the Antichrist is coming. I mean, it has to be soon then, right? You're asking a lot of questions. When Nero was marrying little boys and slaughtering Christians, do you know that? Do you know that the early church felt this way? They're like, oh man, it's, this is it. When the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, when Hitler rose to power, when all these things happened, guess what? Our redemption was still not. But you know, Israel is kind of surrounded right now, so the end is near. Probably with the wait, whoa, 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 whoa. If, 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 you, if you have the time to figure it out, you better get ready to sell a book because we've been doing this for years. Uh, 1800s, I don't have a name, how Lindsay, uh, in the 70s, someone else in the 80s, the 90s, the Antichrist was Reagan, it was Clinton, it was Obama, the list was on and on and on. And we kept asking the wrong questions. It's smoking mirrors, ladies and gentlemen. Don't get sidetracked. There is no timeline. We will not know when Jesus is 
going to come and he tells us this over and over again. It's not for us to know. Jesus said, not me. He uses two Greek words for the disciples to get their focus on, right? It's two Greek words for time. He uses the chronos and the kairos. And he said, hey, it's not for you to know the chronos is a long time frame, like long season that can stretch from 10 days to 100 days to 1,000 years to 10,000 years. And you're not going to know the epoch or the kairos. You're not even going to know the moment. So stop asking. Nothing in the Bible tells us that we're to fear any antichrist or taking the mark of the beast. You do not accidentally lose your salvation. Did you accidentally get saved? No. So you're not going to accidentally lose. Don't worry about it. It's all about your allegiance right now. Who do you stand with? Because the king who already rules our hearts, rules his church, and he already rules the world. If he rules your heart, you call him Lord, you call him master. That's in our thick and thin our valleys, mountaintops, everything. We call him Lord and faith, trust in that reality over this kind of questions. So our job in church is to stop asking when the relief is coming and start asking, what can I do, Lord? What can I do for your kingdom now that's right here? What do we do with the spirit we have and the kingdom, the priesthood that we already are? Are you saying we're kingdom right? Yeah. I think the Bible says it's every year tonight. Go follow the kingdom and the priesthood of the whole Bible. You'll see a beautiful picture of what God calls us now. The evidence of the kingdom, ladies and gentlemen, is in our midst this morning. And I know it would be really cool to see like angels and cherubim and like structures and transparent floors and glass and all that stuff. I like sci-fi too. But the kingdom's already here if you look around. It's in his body and powered by the Spirit of God. To proclaim this message, to, to proclaim freedom to someone who is just in, in total bondage and chaos and say, yeah, I know what it's for now it's not as you believe, you're going to suffer, but the cool part is you're going to be victorious. And there's a light in the inside. We all try to run this world. And we dominate the kingdom of God not by becoming a world superpower or a military headquarters. That is not how we win in the kingdom of God. We go out and we preach. By the power of the Spirit, the gospel. Yes, the Bible, the Word of God. This is how we win. We don't become more powerful by a crude world either. And I'm not all well, I'm not saying all well is evil, but are you willing to forsake it? Are you willing to leave it all?